Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank you, Jim, for inviting us here and give us the opportunity to tell about our research. So I will talk about social parasites, mainly a certain type of parasitic group, inquilines, an awkward word, but I try to explain as well I, as I can. Here is um, the outline of my talk. First, brief introduction to ants, then the types of social parasites that are known, some speciation models, particularly that apply to inquilines, then um, polygyny, the presence of multiple queens uh, in a nest. I explain about that because it's really important in inquiline evolution. Then um, results on sympatric speciation of inquilines. Some papers have come up with this, this kind of uh, speciation scenario, and I explained that. And then finally, I will um, talk about a particular Myrmica inquiline of Myrmica rubra and, and explain a little bit the history and the present status of that inquiline. Ants form just one family, the Formicidae, and currently um, the species diversity is 17 subfamilies, less than 500 genera, and a little, little over 16,000 species. So it's a small group, just 2% of global insect uh, diversity. And um, in comparison to the Coleopterans and Lepidopterans, ants are really a small group. But less is more. The biomass of ants is, is really great. Uh, despite of low uh, species diversity, the biomass of ants exceeds that of vertebrates. Now I saw in Jim's room, I, I saw a little picture um, where even the humans were included. So I, I, I assume that in vertebrates also human, hum, the humans are included. I'm not sure, but maybe. So uh, the ants can be said to be a successful group. Um, they can be found just about everywhere. And use sociality is really the key trait in this success. And use sociality includes three features. Reproductive division of labor, so that you have in, in an ant nest, you have a group of individuals that specialize on reproduction, and then the rest uh, do the work of the colony. Overlapping generations, so you have mother, larvae, and, and adult workers at the same time in the nest. And these workers cooperate in caring of the offspring. So all these traits uh, enable colonies to grow really not large and have um, a lot of individuals. There, I'm standing behind this large colony in southern Finland, and we haven't cal calculated, but there must be some million, two millions of workers in this colony. Um, all ants are used social, except some parasites have got rid of the use sociality features. Uh, social parasitism means the coexistence in the same nest of two species of social insects where the other species is parasitizing the other, depending on it in, in many ways. Uh, social parasitism is also extended to include some non-social insects where these non-social insects utilize a social insect. And a good example is a, a Good examples are Lysinid butterflies, like here the large, oops, the large blue, um, where the larva of the butterfly needs to be picked up by an ant worker and carried to the nest of the, um, of the ant colony where the butterfly larva starts eating ant offspring, perhaps eating most of the offspring until it hatches. So there are three types of social parasites, and the first group is temporary parasites. 
as the name says, they are dependent on the host during a short period of, period of time, namely when they found their colony. Um, the, once the colony is founded, the, um, the parasitic phase end, ends and the colony becomes um, of this, this um, formerly parasitic um, uh, ant. In temporary parasitism, the parasite and the host are often in, belong often to the same genus, and, and it's a common uh, phenomenon in the genera Formica and Lassius. Here, a Lassius um, regine parasite is attacking a Lassius alien, alienus host queen, so um, rubbing, rubbing itself on the Elienus host queen to get the smell and then be able to enter the nest. The second group of social parasites um, or social parasitism is slavery or slave making. And in slave making, the workers of this parasitic species raid the nest of another species, capture their brood, and rear them as nest mates in their colony. The parasite and the host may or may not be of the same genus, as here Polyagus and Formica, also depicted here in this picture, uh, black slaves and red Polyagus uh, slave makers. But also you may have them in the same genus, Formica raiding Formica, and then in the Myrmicin ants, Hapacoxinus uh, raiding Leptothorax. Then the third type of uh, social parasitism is inquilinism. These inquilines usually have no workers and thus they depend on the host for all their colony tasks. So um, workers were crucial in, this, uh, in these eusocial traits and since they have no workers, they have lost most of the social traits and can be considered uh, secondarily uh, non-social. So the rest of my talk will concentrate on inquilines. Social parasitism is uh, quite rare, particularly inquilinism. Here I have listed uh, five subfamilies, their species numbers, the numbers of inquilines found, and then the percentage of inquilines of this total species number. As you can see, it's 1% or even less, uh, the percentage of inquilines. The Myrmicine, it's the largest ant subfamily with nearly 7,000 species, and it has 68 inquiline species, and yet um, the percentage is only very small. <coughs> more inquilines will be detected with uh, more work, particularly in the tropics. That has been, recent studies have shown that there are undiscovered species in the tropics. Ever since Darwin, people have speculated how these, how these social parasites evolve. Even Darwin speculated it and, and has ri written about it. And there are some explanations. One is a kind of called loose form of this Emery, um, a myrmecologist, um, and it's called uh, Emery's rule and loose form of it. And it states that the parasites generally are closely related to the species they serve as uh, slaves or hosts. And if this is put in a phylogenetic context, you find the parasites forming a monophyletic group and the um, hosts being perhaps the sister group. So parasites are monophyletic and, and like in the um, same genus, they might um, form their group and then the host form another group in, within the genus. Here, allopatric uh, mode of speciation is accepted without testing. That's like the norm in this kind of situation. The other um, suggestion for the origin of these parasites is a strict form of this rule, where the parasite and host are each other's closest relatives, i.e. they are sister species. And on a phylogeny, the parasite and host derive from 
the same common ancestor and are then um, closest to each other. Here, a symmetric speciation is a plausible uh, scenario, though uh, to convince the science community, very strong evidence is required to, to support the sympatric mode of speciation, because sympatric speciation still is rather controversial. There have been some phylogenetic tests of these parasite host relationships. Um, in cases where the clues loose form um, has been accepted, um, there have been bumblebees, wasps, and some ants. Then there are cases where the strict form, the sister species relationship, has been found in allodabine bees and in ants in three genera that all belong to this myrmicine subfamily Acromyrmex, Mycocepurus, and Myrmica. Um, we have studied uh, phylogenetic relationships of uh, inquiline host pairs, <coughs> and in our phylogeny we included seven inquiline host pairs, and four of these pairs were the closest relatives to each other. And in three uh, pairs, inquiline host pairs, uh, they were sister species. So here, Hirsuta sabuleti and rubra microgyne, rubra and its microgyne parasite, both collected in Finland, and then Kebegensis and Alaskensis collected in North America. And, and here uh, we have suggested that sympatric speciation is a likely likely uh, speciation uh, mode in these inquiline. We also had, uh, or uh, we also um, have speculated and some of these close relatives may have originated in the same way, but these inquilines are rather old and it's difficult to go back or to, to know what happened in these um, or how these inquilines originated. So, sympatric speci speciation, we have hypothesized or suggested that, but it has not always re been uh, received quite well. And, and it's been, offered, it's been um, suggested that these could still, these inquilines, originate th in, through allopatric speciation. So, I just go through briefly uh, the um, normal allopatric speciation model and then include the few steps that are required uh, if inquilines would originate uh, through allopatric speciation. So, uh, the ordinary allopatric speciation model, you have a population, then uh, a geographic barrier splits the population uh, into two, and then uh, these two populations adapt to their environments and start to diverge until they become two good species. Now, if, if we put the inquiline story here, inquiline evolution here, that um, we need to add that the, the other here, the green, green population, uh, migrates over the barrier that initially separated this population and um, colonize the former range of, of, the, of the other species. Then some of these individuals start to parasitize, these, some of these green groups start to parasitize this um, other uh, population or other species. And then the most closest relative of this green uh, species would go ex extinct, so that um, then we have here, if we would sequence these individuals, these would be each other's closest relatives, because this would not be found, because it's gone extinct. So, this would have happened repeatedly, if this were the case, it would have happened repeatedly, seven or eight times in Myrmica. And um, we consider this a very complex scenario, it's not impossible, sometimes, but to go on repeatedly mm, might be unlikely. 
Anyway, this has been the um, argument against sympatric speciation, and, and this has been offered as the alternative. So, um, if uh, inquilines evolve uh, sympatrically, there are some traits that really come to play and are important in these ants that I, I will talk about next, mainly Myrmica. And polygyny is really important. Polygyny means the presence of multiple queens in a nest. And it's, in ants, it's a derived trait. So in a polygynous colony, you may have from two up to hundreds of queens and then workers. Monogyny, the ancestral form, ancestral trait in ants means that you only have one single queen in a nest, plus workers. And this polygyny has interesting implications for, for other traits in the, in the colonies. Namely, these monogynous colonies, um, the workers are hostile. To, to alien individuals. For example, extra queens. If an extra newly mated queen would try to enter this monogynous colony, she would be stopped, probably killed instantly. Whereas these polygynous colonies, workers accept extra queens and even foreign ones are welcomed into the nest. Um, this gynae is related to dispersal of ants, a common ecological trait in many species. So in monogyny, in a situation you have a monogynous colony and, and so one queen in one nest, and I put it briefly, M and M, tactique, um, the uh, new females dispersal, disperse to new areas, and once they leave their nest, they take part in mating swarms with males, and maybe um, flying high up and further away until um, they found their colonies singly. And this tactic is ideal when, um, when uh, dispersing to um, new sites. And for a female to be able to fly and disperse, she has to be large. She has to have good uh, wing muscles because small queens, they cannot, they cannot fly. So large females is the um, norm mainly in these monogynous colonies and require, a requirement for dispersal. Polygyny is advan advantageous in some ecological condi conditions and here polygyny, many queens in many nests. So not just many queens in a nest, but this kind of system starts to bud and split. So you may have many nests in, in an area. Um, and the nests may cover extensive uh, distances. So basically the colony, the mother colony starts to split. The workers uh, move offspring and move to these other sites and eventually you have a multi-nest system, maybe a super colony um, with a, ne a dense nest system. And this is best uh, reached by producing many small cooperating queens. You don't, when you don't have to fly, um, big wing muscle, muscles and big size is basically a waste. So. Uh, small queens are good enough for walking from one nest site to another. And this is a within site, within site tactic, uh, a good one to fill up uh, the area. And just to note that many invasive ant species are highly polygynous and follow this PP tactic. Some species are Lassius neglectus and Linepitema humila, which you probably are familiar quite well. But also Myrmica rubra is, is an invasive pest in North America um, and has invaded many areas with um, almost super colonies. Now, there is a classical example of a species where both these tactics are used, and it's a Myrmica rutinodis. 
it uses these two tactics. Monokinous colonies, they have just one large queen and they uh, live in short-lived habitats and then disperse to new, new sites. Polygynous colonies, they contain usually many small queens and specialize on stable habitats, especially in uh, England, on heather, moorland, where this uh, system has been uh, studied. But, of course, nothing is clear and, and straightforward, so there, uh, there is no clear out clear cut dichotomy because you can have small and large queens, uh, polygynous, and then you can have small and large queens in the same nest at the same time. So there's a tendency for these two tactics, but also a mix of them. So polygyny is important because it may lead to a chain of events, which are now in the inquiline evolution uh, really important. You've seen already that the queens tend to become smaller in, in polygynous colonies. Um, and, and it's called the miniaturization, uh, which is a universal trait in inquilines. Um, it's been documented in almost every inquiline system. Then some of these smaller queens um, may start to cheat by producing mainly sexual offspring and giving up their social duties to produce worker offspring. Then these small queens may shift their mating time or particularly mating site. I explained that uh, um, large queens tend to take part in mating, mating um, flights and swarms outside the nest, but these small queens, they, um, they tend to mate inside the nest. Um, of course, these um, mating swarms, they are dependent on weather conditions somehow, so this could also uh, um, result in different mating time, because in the nest, within the nest, you could basically mate any time if, if both sexuals are around. So this could start a divergence between cheaters and non-cheaters. Here we do not yet have inquilines, we have just cheaters and non-cheaters. But they start to diverge. Now um, this queen, you may have heard, some of you anyway, of this queen effect and what it has to do with becoming smaller, growing m smaller. Normally in an ant colony, the presence of the fertile queen, the mother queen, uh, stimulates the workers to favor small worker-biased larvae. In essence, the queen wants more workers in the colony so that it can run smoothly. But she inhibits the growth of large larvae due to develop sexuals. So she does not allow other um, females to be produced. <coughs> These, these large larvae are killed by workers, or workers um, bite them so much that eventually these large larvae are killed. Uh, it's been shown that in Myrmica this queen effect is really an old and conserved trait. Um, in laboratory experiments, orphaned colonies accept even an alien queen of another species, they accept her and start working um, with her, um, along her signals, so to speak. Then it's also known in Myrmica that queen size is genetically determined. Here, large queens produce only large queens, and small queens produce only small queens. So, queen size and its significance in inquiline evolution is quite dramatic. When the polygyne queen becomes smaller, it is a significant step in the evolution to an inquiline social parasite. So here, um, the queen effect comes to play because the small queens, they are like um, worker-sized but equipped with female reproductive systems. The workers do not detect them, 
they detect only large queens, so they let the small queens uh, live. And thus these small queens uh, stay alive and start um, producing sexual offspring. So this is basically the scenario behind the sympatric speciation model. And there are some studies where um, most of these traits have been quite nicely documented. The, the best one comes from a Mycocaporus castrator, which has evolved from its Geldi host. Um, this is a lower attine fungus growing ant um, found in Brazil. And, and Rabeling et al. Have, they have studied the, the inculine and the host quite, quite extensively and, and they can conclude that uh, these, this inculine and host have res, um, obtained reproductive is isolation. So they, they are different units. Then a second relatively good case comes from our studies, Myrmica rubra and its inquiline. Um, we have shown genetic divergence, but we also have shown that there is some introgression still. So the inquiline and the host, they still hybridize and, and change genes, so they're not totally reproductively isolated from each other. So here um, I show some data from our study. Uh, based on 12 microsatellite markers, a principal component analysis. So um, here, the small inquiline and, and the large host. So the two morphs are correlated with the genetic, genetic data as the, the um, inquilines cluster in their group nicely and, and so does the host. But there is some... some um, overlap in, in the material. Um, in addition to this principal component analysis, we have um, done many different analyses and they all come to the same conclusion that um, the inquiline is significantly different from the host. Then here we have some um, chemical analyses. Um, this Myrmica rubra and its inquiline, they are separated, they come close, but they are clearly separated in this host. And then the hirsuta sabuleti, also they uh, are quite nicely separated in the, in the chemical data. So we have concluded that they are not completely reproductive isolated, uh, Myrmica rubra and its inquiline. So what then is Myrmica rubra? Here, I don't know if you can see this uh, article well, but um, the uh, good and known uh, taxonomist, European taxonomist Bernard Seifert, he uh, described this inquiline of rubra as Myrmica microrubra in 1993. That was based on morphological features, mainly size. Basically, the inquiline and the host, they are identical in all traits except the size. The, the females form a bimodal distribution when their um, thorax uh, was measured. Then in uh, 2006, um, somewhat controversial or anyway, uh, sympatric hostile attitude uh, can be detected in this paper where uh, these people, including Bernard Seifert, they synonymized the inquiline with, with rubra. But I must say the data was not very convincing, but yet they wanted to synonymize it. Then recently Seifert has um, um, discussed about the inquiline, and here I have highlighted that um, the genetic aspect of the, the microgynes and macrogynes, that microgynes only produce microgynes and macrogynes produce only macrogynes, uh, but plenty of workers. So um, uh, it's difficult to know what's going on in, in Seifert's mind, but maybe he's thinking of um, reviving the synonymy. Well, we know that um, the inquiline produces workers occasionally, and, in, and some hybridization and intercression takes place between the inquiline and the host. 
We know, though, that um, interbreeding is not a, a, a cri criterion, or it's, it's commonly assumed that good species do not interbreed, though um, in other species, at least 10% of animals hybridize and still, still remain good coherent uh, units. So, um, talking about this inquiline um, and the somewhat, um, we, have, we find differences, but not completely. So, one can say that reproductive isolation is a byproduct. Once the population split and start to adapt in their environments, they accumulate differences, genetic, morphological, behavioral, that eventually um, uh, results in reproductive isolation between the two to um, units or species, and despite a few um, interbreedings, the units uh, or the entities of these species um, stay, they will not homogenize. And maybe this is something that Pernod Seifert, what he has stated to Curry, that he might be thinking of reviving the microrubra, but we will see if he's going to do it. So, um, to specifics of sympatric speciation, the inquilines have various traits in just about all inquilines that um, help to explain how sympatric speciation is possible. But um, more detailed studies have been done in phytophagous insects and, and particularly sympatric speciation in these groups and particularly VIA has shown that it's only a small part of the genome where this divergent select le selection may be affecting. There could be still lots of gene flow going on in the other part of the genome. Also, um, recent studies have shown that just by looking at sequence differences, you might, you might never um, find the final clue what is going on. There may be some regula regulatory changes taking place that really affect how the um, phenotype evolves. So, um, fruitful prospects for studying this inquiline of Myrmica rubra we have here, or anybody else who is interested. Thank you.